We're just going to talk about this vehicle behind me, the Grizzly, because it's about to head off from the museum. It's been a gate guard here for some time. In other words, it's been standing out the front of the museum, so it looks a little bit rough around the edges. Most armoured vehicles don't like being outside. However big butch they look, they still end up uh, getting moss growing on them, rust, water ingress, etc. But this particular vehicle, we're actually loaning it to the Military History Museum in Vienna. They haven't got an example of any type of uh, the Sherman family at all, so they want to borrow this from us. So just before it goes, we thought we'd uh, tell you a little bit about Grizzlies. So this is part of the Sherman story, but it's a version of the Sherman that is built in Canada. Now, in 1939, when Canada for the first time starts putting an armoured force together, they've got British tanks, they've got some light 6Bs that they're training with. But after the fall of France in 1940, the onus is we're going to have to perhaps build our own tanks, especially if Britain might fall, um, and moving tanks across the Atlantic is going to be hard work. So what happens is they start putting a design together that uses the chassis underneath of the M3 Lee tank that the Americans are already designing and putting into production. They have a casting, a new casting on the hull and a new turret. And that turret is going to hold the British six pounder gun. It's a much smaller uh, looking turret than you're used to seeing on uh, other tanks at the time, Shermans, etc. Now that tank they call the Ram tank and they actually make in Canada, about 1,950 of these Ram tanks. Um, they're mainly used for training. Some do go to Europe and end up getting used as artillery observation vehicles in the Northwest Europe campaign. But as they're building these already, um, the consensus is between the British and the Americans, it's going to be the M4 Sherman tank that we really want to fight the war with and is going to be built in the larger numbers. So they decide in Canada, let's transfer production from the Ram tank over into making this new version of a Sherman that's going to be called the Grizzly. Now, for various reasons, the uh, all sorts of administrative problems, other produ production problems, delay the production until about October of 1943 and then they start making this new tank, the Grizzly, and they only actually make it for a couple of months. They make about 188 of them and then stop. And the reason for that is American production is now fully geared up. There's an awful lot now of the M4 Shermans coming off the production line. The Americans are then starting to build better versions of the M4 with newer turrets, the bigger 76 millimeter gun. So in the end, Canada decides it is not worth continuing the production of this version of the Grizzly and they stop making those after only about 188 of them and they move on to using the same chassis and hull to put to make the Mark II Sexton tank which is basically self-propelled artillery with a 25 pounder gun in. Why there's quite a number of these Grizzlies left around the place is in the 50s quite a number of Grizzly tanks and Sextons were sold to Portugal when they were rearming, becoming part of NATO and those tanks were later in the 1980s sold in fairly large batch to the UK where the collector's market bought lots of them. And quite a number of these originally being Grizzly tanks have been made to look more like standard American M4 Sherman tanks. And why is that? Because of course really the M4 sees all the action, the Grizzly doesn't so much. It's uh, really only used for training or later on being passed on as we said to Portugal and other armies. Um, how you can tell the difference? If you look at this sprocket on the front, um, this has 17 uh, teeth in on the sprocket. The normal bog standard Sherman only has about 13 teeth on. So that's one of the classic indicators you're looking at a Grizzly. Although some Grizzlies later on in their production run, um, or not so much the production run, but later in their service careers, they actually had these sprockets changed and they used something called uh, Canadian dry pin track which again was a, a specific type of track that's been designed 
unlike the American, most of the American track, just to have metal, not rubber inserts. And again, the worry in the war was with the loss of Malaya, et cetera, there wasn't going to be um, enough rubber available. So we're gonna to have to go for a lighter but metal track as opposed to the earlier heavier and rubber block track that was being used mainly by the Americans. There's other features on the vehicle that are unique to the Grizzly. Um, there's stowage elements that are different, gun locks, etc., for movement. Um, there's things going on there um, that change the, the, the look of the vehicle only really in details, but from a distance, an awful lot of people will probably just immediately register this as just being like a Sherman tank. And that's really its fundamental basics underneath it all. Um, as I mentioned, they don't see much in the way of action. Our particular vehicle, it ends up coming to the UK. We think this is one of the first 25 made. Uh, the reason for that is it doesn't have extra armour placed on the side, applique armour, and in the production run. These uh, castings, by the way, actually come from Illinois, Granite City, Illinois. It's actually their American castings. And that G on the front, some people, you can see it on the front there, some people saw that G as being standing for Grizzly. No, it's not. Um, it's actually uh, the, the, the company that's actually in Granite City, Illinois, that's uh, making the steel and doing the castings. It's not actually specific to Grizzlies. So this is a vehicle, it'll be heading off out to Vienna and uh, with any luck they're going to be able to do some tidying up work and you'll be able to see it there if you happen to visit Vienna and see their uh, very wonderful um, military history museum which is really worth a visit as well. They've got some stunning items there including of course the car um, that Franz Ferdinand was actually assassinated in just before the First World War. So a stunning collection and again one of the things the Tank Museum does get our vehicles around the place loaned to other museums.